I went to state prison in 1991. I gained my GED while I was there. I did pretty well on parole. I got off parole, except for the one time that I ran through a technical violation. When that happened, it took everything from me. And it was just one day, you go to your parole or so, and he's waiting for you. He's waiting for you with handcuffs, and there's nothing you could do about it. I made an illegal U-turn. It's a traffic ticket. You can't, you don't even take points for that. And I did 90 days for it. So imagine. I said, wait a minute, I'm on my way now. The only reason why I missed an appointment with her is because the job I just started, they had me on a 90-day probational period. I can't miss any days. I need this job, and now you're telling me that you're locking me up because I missed an appointment to come see you? While on parole, I was never told that I, I would be violated if I left rehabilitation. I was in the hospital for two days. They had to identify me. That's when I found out, you know, I had a warrant on me. So I had to sit there and sit it out for 11 and a half months. About 20 seconds for me, Entering there, I, I just got into the store. A whole bunch of police raided, apparently looking for drugs. The officers finally admitted to them that I had nothing. They didn't find nothing in my person. But then they didn't take that into a, a account. If you really want to go to how you're playing with people's livelihoods, you really need to do a thorough investigation, you know. Right? That's what happens. It's life, right? See, I love you. It's stopping them from working. It's breaking their families up. It's not actually helping them to rehabilitate themselves. He had got a really good job because he had picked up a trade while he was incarcerated the last time. They wouldn't they wouldn't make him do the job because where the job was. It was in New Rochelle. He couldn't go out the five boroughs. It's like we can't win for losing. When you talk about these so-called technical violations, it's not technical to the kid who can never see her mom again because she showed up late for a meeting. That's not technical. That's devastating for that individual child. It was traumatizing for us because you don't know if mom's gonna be here in two weeks, three weeks. You couldn't have told me checking your mail, or checking your apartment that they know about, they could violate you and send you back to prison for that. So he added on another year of supervised release and sent me back to jail for three months. I even tried to commit suicide. How am I supposed to take care of my son? How am I supposed to support us? Like, if nobody's giving me a chance. I feel scared for myself and I feel scared for my mom. It's a journey that you don't see the light. You lose hope and everything becomes about going to see somebody in jail. Everyone knows someone in this country, whether it's a family member, a close friend, or now even me, who has experienced incarceration, post-incarceration, or even pretrial detention. I don't want you to judge me off the way I look or the way I may talk or the way I carry myself. I want you to judge me off of my actions. I, I looked at all the things in my life that I had lost. Um, people who were very important to me. One was my mother. And um, thank God. Excuse me. Reform means to take something that is broken and to fix it, make it better, not to continue to crack it. Like, even though, you know, when you break a plate, it's not ever going to go back together again, but you can at least try. Parole don't even try to, to fix it. It just wants to keep cracking it and cracking it, breaking it. You know, he, he started out this way. He took his rocky turn, but he's back on smooth ground again. And that's what I'm looking forward to. Welcome to Activate Diversity, Pathways to Equal Justice. This program is the third part program in a series called Activate Diversity. This series just addresses different uh, forms of diversity related initiatives over an entire year. My name is Alfreda Cower, and I have the pleasure of serving as the, uh, the, the, the chair of this great division. Of course, I'm a little biased that this division is great. And I think my members are, guess what? incomparable, but what would you expect the chair to say? But here in the division, we do a lot of great things and diversity, activating diversity is one of the things that I've committed my administration to, as well as public service and giving opportunities to serve. Here in the division, we're dedicated to, again, like I said, equal justice and fairness. And so we don't shy away from tackling difficult issues. And that is why we are in fact here today. 
because we all know, given the climate of America right now, this is pretty hot, a pretty hot topic and a pretty difficult issue. And so we have a great panel here today prepared to discuss with you. The panel is here to discuss with you criminal justice reform and the disparate impact it has on communities of color. So I know you're going to be excited about the panelists you're going to see, but before you get to the panelists, you ought to be real hyped about our moderator that's coming up. This program, we can imagine a better moderator. We have before a senior judge, Phyllis Cote. Judge Cote is a member of the GP Solo Division. She's also a member, if I must say so, the greatest sorority of this side of heaven, Delta Sigma Theta, Sorority Incorporated. <laughs> She's currently employed at the FIU Law School here in South Florida in Miami as a clinical professor. Um, she's received many accolades. She received an award most recently in December that was rendered by a difference maker, rendered by our division. There's so many things and great things I can tell you. Part of stuff that she's teaching at the law school deals with criminal justice reform and criminal and regular social injustice. But of all the things I could tell you, read you her bio, which I won't, the thing that the greatest accolade I can say, give to my line sister, is that she is a true public servant. And I do mean that, a true public servant. Having served as a prosecutor for many years, and I'm still trying to forgive her for that, but you know, she did that for a while and then became a judge on the bench, and now she's a senior judge. So it is my pleasure to introduce to you a great friend, a great lawyer, a great judge, and a great moderator, Je Senior Judge Phyllis Cote. Judge Cote? Thank you, Alfreda, and thank you for all of you here, here today. We are so excited about this program. Today, we are going to explore criminal justice reform by examining these pathways or pathways to equal justice. The goal of the Criminal um, Reform Alliance, who is the group that, that uh, produced the opening video, is to dramatically reduce the number of people who are needlessly trapped in the system by changing laws, policies, practices, and all those things that perpetuate injustice. Key to their strategy is changing the hearts and minds of those who support real change. But key to our strategy here today is to create an impetus for positive change and reform. Our legal system is in need of change. The criminal justice system has become desensitized to the suffering that it inflicts upon citizens by imprisonment. It is estimated that on any given day, jail cells in the United States hold approximately 2.2 million individuals. The criminal justice system is fiscally unable to sustain it with prison, and it imposes a burdensome human toll on individuals and an unparalleled impact on communities of color. The criminal justice system is particularly fraught in Indian country, where natives are generally subject to concurrent federal jurisdiction and with it disproportionate expo expo exposure to the federal death penalty, outsized incarceration sentences, and inadequate inmate services. Bail reform is only the beginning of a push for criminal justice reform that is now being seen with police departments and the demands to defund or reform. Disproportionate treatment of citizens occurs at every stage of the criminal justice process, from unfair arrests, excessive charging, to disparate sentencing. Returning citizens face the harsh reality of the implications of their incarceration and suffer great discrimination. Bail and sentencing reform are concurrent movements to activate diversity and change the criminal justice system. We need new and innovative ways to adjust these, uh, address these inequities, and our speakers today and panelists today will help us look at these changes. Their extended biographies are available and on the GP Solo website. But by way of brief introduction, Kanye Bennett is a senior policy Council and Legislative Coalition Manager at the Bail Project. This project seeks to combat mass incarceration by disrupting the money bail system one person as a, at a time. 
Kenya advanced criminal justice reform at the federal level at the American Constitution Society and the ACLU. Alvin Barlow is a criminal defense attorney in the state of Florida and the CEO of Technologies for Justice. Moved by the obvious disparity in sentencing, he created what is now known as Equity and Sentencing Analysis System, which employs technology to secure equity in sentencing. Jason Soul's original goal with his Humanize My Hoodie project, now a movement, was to shift the paradigm of black men in hoodies while working as an adjunct professor of college. His journey and work to perform criminal justice reform is chronicled in his book, From Prison to PhD, a memoir of hope, resilience, and second chances. Lauren Van Schilfgaard is director at UCLA of the Tribal Legal Development Clinic, which provides legal services to tribes focused on developing tribal law and enhancing tribal sovereignty. Representative Raymond Dean is a politician and community organizer for criminal justice reform who served in the Minnesota House of Representatives from 2012 until 2020. In 1982, he was granted a full pardon after a felony conviction in 1976. Representative Joanna McClinton was elected to the Pennsylvania House of Representatives in 2015. She was most recently re-elected and elected to serve as the House Democratic leader. She began her work on criminal justice as a public defender. And I want to start with you, Representative McClinton. I mean, we saw the video and we, we, we noticed the, the, the video included Meek Mills. And this is actually a, a project that, it, that includes work that he is now uh, championing in terms of, of criminal justice reform. But my question to you is what impact um, um, does your role as a legislator play on creating these criminal justice pathways? Like how, how, do, you, how, how do you use the, the public and public sentiment in terms of deciding or, or choosing or, 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 or supporting a, a particular kind of reform? So first of all, thank you for having me. I'm so glad to be here with this great panel. And thank you, Judge, for that question. So in terms of listening to the public, I mean, the first thing for any elected representative is to hear what your constituents are saying. What are your neighbors saying? Whether you had a town hall or whether you're getting emails or whether you have someone come into your office and just say, hey, my daughter has been on probation for too long and she can't get a job. I mean, these are things that I actually hear. And when I add in the seven years I spent as an assistant public defender here in Philly at the Defender Association, I witnessed with my own eyes, um, and no disrespect to this judge, but other judges keep people on probation perpetually with a thought that they're saving them from something or saving them from themselves or saving them from some addiction, um, just perpetuating probation and, and supervision when in fact they're restricting their freedoms, their rights, and any drop of a dime, they lose everything. They're incarcerated, they're revoked, they're resentenced, they lose their children, they lose their housing, they lose their job. But most importantly, when you're under that type of scrutiny for a prolonged period, you lose hope. So in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, we have a great Great group of legislators working on criminal justice reform. And we came very close in our last session to being able to change the way people are supervised on probation. What we want to do is add caps. Every state has caps for how long you can be sentenced. But what we've seen in this Commonwealth is we have so many people who are under supervision and it gets so long that it's no longer worth the time even for the probation and parole officers to keep supervising them. Now we know there's a contingency of very very violent people that need to be in jail. That is without question. But there are many other folks who come home and who make great decisions every day, but that pressure of years of scrutiny under probation, it gets defeating and they end up not being able to withstand some of the different tests that just come with time in life. So we're listening to constituents 
we have a work group where we're continuing to try to get that bill uh, moved. And as you saw in the video, McMill, he's someone that we all rallied around um, from the Pennsylvania legislature to try to get him out and use his case to amplify how this isn't a problem for a superstar. It's a problem for the names we don't know. And as a former PD, it was a problem for many of my clients. So that's something we want to do as legislatures, changing the law without you know handcuffing judges, but want to make sure that they don't fall into the temptation of wanting to supervise people eternally because that just doesn't do the society good. That doesn't protect anybody and it doesn't help the people get on the right path. Thank you. Thank you. We know that bail reform is really a pathway um, and, and the bail project um, has really undertaken the work of, of doing this. So Kenya, I wanted to ask you, can you describe the work of the bail project and, and how it's spreading across the country in terms of, of what you do and how you do it? Yes, thank you so much, Judge, for that question. And before I respond, I also want to thank Attorney Coward and her colleagues at the American Bar Association for assembling this panel, as well as this series around activating diversity. It is critical that as this nation reckons with racial inequality, that the legal community lead and model here as our country works towards resolution. So very happy to be a part of this panel. Thank you for having me. And I'm delighted to be with such distinguished colleagues. The Bail Project is a national nonprofit that has been operating since 2018 to advance criminal, racial, and economic justice by paying bail for people in need. As you shared at the start of the panel, Judge, you talked about the more than 2 million people who are incarcerated. And we know when it comes to jails, that on any given day, that there are about half a million people there who are awaiting trial. They are there because they cannot afford bail. After a person has been arrested and booked, they find that bail is really going to determine their fate in the criminal legal system. A person with financial resources can buy their liberty, and a person without such means cannot. Neither one, however, has been convicted of a crime. Both are legally presumed innocent. At the Bail Project, we know that freedom makes all of the difference. We know that if a person is incarcerated pretrial, they are more likely to take a plea to get out of jail or be convicted by a judge or jury and then sentenced to longer prison terms. And in the spirit of today's conversation on activating justice, the Bail Project appreciates that our work is, is racial justice work. And, and we know that there's a disproportionate impact that the criminal legal system has on people of color. At the pretrial stage, we know that black and brown people disproportionately represent those detained pretrial, accounting for 50% of the pretrial population nationwide. And we also know that if you're black or Latinx, the judge is likely to set a bail amount twice as high as the average bail set for a white person. So what the bail project has set out to do is what you think that it, it does, as the Bail Project, we're providing bail assistance to, to people, and we are trying to make that difference. We have, since 2018, we have helped 12,000 people come home and stay home pre-trial. We have helped clients make more than 27,000 court appearances. And again, what we have learned in assisting our clients is that when you're out pre-trial, you are more likely to have a favorable disposition with respect to your case. For our clients who have had cases closed, nearly 40% had their cases entirely dismissed and less than 10% spent additional days in jail as part of a sentence. People who would otherwise be detained pretrial are able to remain home with family, they're able to go to work, they're able to maintain critical community ties. And at the Bail Project, we are really pushing this community release with support model. We at the Bail Project are offering not just bail, but we are helping with court notifications, transportation assistance, referrals to voluntary social services and community resources, anything that a person is going to need to ensure that they return to court and ideally end their entanglement with the criminal legal system. On the policy, mm -hmm. and, and on the policy team, I help push systemic reforms. So what we want to do with the Bail Project is put ourselves out of business. And we want to interject ourselves right now and, and assist with bail. But in the long term, we want to end cash bail and we want to end pretrial detention. 
Thank, Thank you. you, Judge. Thank you. And we know that, that bail reform uh, or the beginning of bail reform is only a single pathway. And we were very intentional about looking at the disparity in different communities. So, Lori, my next question really is to you, because we know that the Supreme Court really decimated the tribal criminal the tribal criminal justice system with in terms of, of jurisdiction or deciding issues of, of jurisdiction, that many human rights violations are now occurring as a result. Can you talk to us about some of the dramatic or the dramatic impact of these jurisdictional decisions in tribal communities? Yes, thank you. Thank you for that question, Kwatsi. Uh, thank you for having me. So the criminal justice system as it applies to indigenous people is incredibly complex. And as you noted, it's complex in part because uh, in, Indigenous people, depending on where they are, are usually subject to concurrent jurisdiction. That is the tribal jurisdiction for the tribal lands that they're on, as well as federal or state jurisdiction in addition. For lots of uh, Indian communities, Indians are subject to federal jurisdiction, which means that you know, for a crime committed on tribal lands that is only uh, subject to federal jurisdiction because they're Indian, they're subject to juries that are not made up of their peers, they have fewer services, they have no parole, and they're subject to the federal death penalty, which as we saw in the last you know, spate of, of executions, we saw an indigenous person get executed purely because they were indigenous, right? In addition, uh, tribal members are also subject to tribal jurisdiction and not just tribal members, Indians. Um, and this stems from tribal inherent sovereignty, jurisdiction that tribes had pre-contact and retained post-contact, but purely out of a legal farce that the uh, British, you know, that the European colonies invented and that the American government adopted is that by nature of colonization, this inherent sovereignty has retracted. And so now tribes are essentially operate only misdemeanor courts. They have very little ability to really uh, devise what kind of criminal justice system they would operate in the 21st century. And they have no jurisdiction to prosecute non-Indians in their community, which has really contributed to the missing and murdered indigenous persons crisis. So we've got this like crazy like tension going on where we have indigenous people that are overly incarcerated, they are more likely to be killed by the police than any other race in this country. And yet tribes have very little ability to really stem that, uh, that violence that's being perpetrated against indigenous people. Even despite those limitations, which includes uh, you know, extreme limitations on the ability to um, prosecute and incarcerate, as well as over whom they can prosecute and incarcerate, Tribes have nevertheless shown a real tenacity in what they potentially could do if they were able to exercise their jurisdiction. We see lots of, you know, quote, restorative justice programs in tribal communities, which are really reemergence of traditional practices that tribes use to protect their communities. And in part, that's a recognition that there is no throwaway person in an indigenous community. There's someone who's out of balance and needs to be he healed. And their healing usually requires the healing of the entire community. So we're seeing real promise with these programs. We just need the ability to exercise that. First and foremost, we have to know where our indigenous people are. Uh, it's extremely likely that when an indigenous person is picked up off their reservation, they are not likely to be identified as indigenous. They're usually either misclassified their race or they're classified as other. Or as CNN used when uh, detailing uh, demographics on the voting, they're labeled as something else. Right. Either way, indigenous people have no idea where their people are. So first and foremost, we need to identify who they are and identify their tribe because being indigenous is not just a race, it's a citizenship. 
People are dual citizens, and so their tribes should be notified when a tribal member is arrested, prosecuted, and incarcerated. The tribe should have standing in that whole process, and that is definitely not happening. So there's so, a lot uh, of different issues there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so what I really want to focus on at this point is, and, and, and ask you, Al, um, we were talking about disparate treatment in, in the indigenous community, but really that's not the only place where we've seen disparate treatment. And I know for you, seeing this disparate treatment, um, not in bail, but in sentencing, led you to create a program um, that I want you to tell us about in terms of what you're doing and the kinds of successes that you've been able to have. Yes, and thank you for this uh, blessed opportunity to participate, uh, to try to cut across the field. Um, I've been practicing law since 1985, so about, about 35 years. And I started in the state attorney office as an intern, went into public defender's office for two years and came out of a private practice. I would always notice different, um, I guess, things, but I couldn't put my finger on it until I think around 1997, I had an African-American male who uh, had a grand theft charge, had never been arrested before. So I was asking for a, a withhold adjudication and probation so he can get on with his life. Prosecutor said, no, he didn't want to do it and didn't give a, a valid reason. But I, I waited around and saw that he automatically offered a white defendant the same thing that I was trying to get him to offer. He offered that on his own volition. So I just pulled him down the hall and had a private conversation with him. And I told him that the only differences I saw between those two cases were one year in age and that client was white, my client was African-American. And it was almost like, you know, his eyes lit up and he understood at that point that he was treating those two different two people differently. So he wound up giving me what I wanted. But what I noticed was he wasn't trying to hurt my client. So it was something else hidden. And we call it implicit bias now. And what the way it works is you go out of your way to bless or give a break to someone with whom you can readily identify. Well, this all came to a head in 2010 when I had an African-American charged with uh, a rape charge. And he was facing, uh, he was really facing life plus 15 years, he was found not guilty on a life charge, but he was found guilty on the sexual battery charge. And he was just about to go to college, had never been arrested before. And that was his first offense, had a great record in high school, had offers to two uh, colleges to full ride scholarship offers. And so it was a date rape type case. And uh, witnesses came in that, you know, the alleged victim said he wanted to have relations with the lady and everything else. Despite all of that, the state attorney wanted the maximum, which was 15 years on that particular charge. I was trying to explain to the judge who was a novice that that was too much time, but the judge didn't listen to me, gave my client 15 years. Well, about four years later, the uh, Sarasota Health Tribune did a, um, a massive study on disparate treatment in Florida, and it caused me to uh, sit down and create this program that's called the Equity and Sentencing Analysis System. And once we did a created a prototype, I ran the case that I tried back in uh, 2010. So this is like four years later. And it was just like I told that judge, my client had, no one in that jurisdiction had ever received a sentence as high as my client. The average sentence that they were given out was 7.9 to eight years maximum. And so- You were able to show this with a computer? I was able to show that with the data. We have a web-based system. And what happens sometimes is when the judges see the data, and the prosecutors see the data, sometimes they just capitulate and do what's right by the person. So that's how the equity and sentencing analysis system works. Great, thank you, thank you. Now, Jason, I wanna, I wanna go to you at this point because we, we know that incarceration in the criminal justice system really carries its own stigma. But you've managed to work past the stigma that it can attach, but also forcing people to look at the stigma that we've, we've, we've attached to many black and brown individuals in terms of what they look like. Tell us about your, your humanize my, my hoodie. Um, it started as a project, it's a movement now, but why and, and what has been the impact of this program? Well, we're moving the culture. Um, all too often I was caught up in my head about the things that I was going through, but I grew up in the war on drugs. We didn't have all the information. I grew up to teen parents and they were snatching black bodies in my neighborhood. I didn't know what that was. So as I got older, I was having my challenges with the system. And you got to understand, I graduated from high school on time. I never failed a class. So for me to end up in prison didn't make a lot of sense, but I made my mistakes, but I didn't understand structural racism. 
So when I came home from prison, I realized I went from slavery into the new Jim Crow. I'm like, wait, I got to live back in the hood. I promised my people that I was going to get a nice condo with some nice, <laughs> with some nice stuff. And moving on up. I did, yeah, I thought I was about to get at it, but I realized my probation officer and parole officer, they already had a game going with the police and politicians. Like, I didn't realize I was living in a power episode. You know what I'm saying? And when I went to school and started studying, I was like, oh, the system criminal trying to make me a three time convicted felon and wipe me off the map. You shady, your whole thing shady. So for me, you know, I've been a professor for 12 years now and I'm grateful to teach criminal justice to students. And I've always been, you know, pretty radical throughout my life. So I said, you know, I'm teaching my criminal justice students with a hoodie on. I said, I'm gonna teach prison corrections and society, crime and justice in America, diversity issues and criminal justice, all while rocking a hoodie. because. I want you to reduce your threat perception of me before you get that badge and that gun or before you become a probation officer and walking around like you don't know. So humanize my hoodie. We challenging those macroaggressions. We not we we definitely look at microaggressions that white folks have and other systems folks have, but we challenging the macroaggressions. The stuff we can see, we saying, "Hey man, it's time to shut that down." We're not doing all of that playing and talking about a bunch of theory. So I'm an abolitionist, man. Like we can take care of ourselves if we got the resources, man. We smart. Like I'm like with Harriet Tubman, man. She, she was a That's nurse. A girl. She was a cook. She was the general. She wasn't trying to rehab her slave master. She was trying to abolish slavery. That's what I'm doing. I want to be with Ava DuVernay and Colin Kaepernick, and I'm I'm with them. I'm not riding on trying to fix different parts, man, because it's just gonna create another form. Like we need to listen to Angela Davis. We need to listen to Michelle Alexander. We need to listen to other abolitionists because we can actually love and protect ourselves. We don't need all that stuff. I don't want anybody's person to be surveyed and put in a system and like, nah, I'm trying to abolish those systems. Let us get our own businesses. Let us have our own black banks. Let us build black Wall Street. So then we can build Wakanda. So so that's what uh -oh. you <laughs> so, so you know where Wakanda is. And like, in a nutshell, we got a homework hotline where we helping kids who struggle with e-learning. We rocking with Colin Kaepernick on the Know Your Rights camp. If we can arm our people and build a force field around ourselves, we don't have to worry about the system impacting us because we got each other. So we trying to do transformative justice. We trying to, because I mean, criminal justice, you got the better lawyer, you gonna beat me. I'm going to prison. I'm a black guy from Chicago with a nine millimeter. I'm out of there. That's all they see. None of the good stuff. Then restorative justice, let's fix this. Like Lauren stated, man, restorative justice works. It, it helps save my life. Being able to know what a talking piece and how to work through things, and that helped me grow as a person. So learning restorative justice and training it across the country made sense. And I'm grateful to be able to bring that in prisons and out, but we gotta abolish police, man. We gotta abolish prisons, man. They not gonna they're not gonna do better. So I'm not looking at implicit bias. I'm looking at the explicit bias. How many white supremacists do you have on your force? If you can't tell me that, don't waste my time. So humanize my hoodie, we walking in strength and we want black and indigenous liberation. All right, so let, let me ask you this, um, uh, Representative Dean, um, because one of the things that, that struck me as I looked at your life story and all the things that you've done is, you know, you were able to get your rights restored. And I, and I wonder if from your perspective or if you have a position as to how much you're being a white male uh, informed the ability to have that done and, and how have you been in, impacted by the fact that, that you had a criminal conviction? I mean, you know, and all the great work that you've done in the legislature. Well, thank you, Judge. And it's uh, really a, an honor to be here with these other panelists and uh, Jason Sowell, you know, has done great work. I've known Jason for quite some years and, and, and I had a huge advantage. Uh, you know, my offense occurred in 1976, uh, uh, a burglary felony caught in the house. Um, ultimately, I ended up uh, serving seven months uh, and was able to get out to go to drug treatment. And all of that was based on the fact that I was a white kid. I mean, I was 19 years old at the time. Uh, I think the courts looked at me as, well, 
you know, he's a good kid. He just did something bad. Right. Um, you know, my parents would come to court with me, both of them, uh, all those things had an impact. And, and after I, you know, went through treatment successfully, I went into a halfway house. I sort of took advantage of all the opportunities that I had, uh, got early release from probation. Uh, ultimately, you know, in 1982, only six years later, granted, this was a few decades ago, most states have changed. I was able to receive full pardon from the state of Minnesota. And, and so I lived most of my life as if I'd never committed a crime. Uh, and, you know, I mean, I, I was pretty aware that, that, you know, I was pretty lucky in the system. But it wasn't until I moved to North Minneapolis in 2000 that I really began to understand the difference and, and how much uh, privilege I had in this, this criminal justice system. So, so after a few years, I ultimately went to a, a, a critical resistance conference, critical resistance nine in um, Oakland, California, and heard um, Professor Angela Davis speak. And I, was there with some fellow colleagues from a, a nonprofit board addressing issues around criminal justice. Uh, she asked everybody that had a criminal record to stand up and I stood up and everybody was like, okay. Uh, Cause it's not like something I talked about publicly. It was something that, you know, was in the past. It was something I'd done. I'd come through. So I was all okay. And when I got back home, it, it really, it really began to sink into me that, um, I need to tell my story about a system that gave me an incredible advantage and disadvantages other people. And, and that's ultimately why I ran for office. Uh, I was public about my offense. And I, I tell you, being a white guy, being public about your fence is very different than being a black person uh, being public about your fence. Uh, fence. So, so I, you know, I, I've always looked at those advantages. And in 1982, when I received my pardon, I received my rights restored to vote. And, and, and so for me, voting and employment were sort of the two key issues that I, I, I dealt with at the legislature. Uh, chief author of Restore the Vote uh, that would allow all those individuals out in public, uh, not locked up, to be able to, to vote in our elections. And then the other issue was uh, ban the box. Minnesota was one of the first states to pass ban the box so that private employers, not just the public employers, but private employers couldn't ask on an initial application if an individual had a criminal conviction or a criminal charge. Uh, so, so those were some of the leading things. I mean, lots of other things. We've done some great things around um, uh, probation reform, sentencing reform and all those other things because we, we actually have a, a sentencing guidelines commission uh, and they look closely at the law and determined at the law that they could actually put a cap on terms of probation. So Minnesota was known for low incarceration rate but incredibly high uh, probation rate um, and where we'd get 20, 30 year probation. And I'll tell you right now, if you know, studies have shown that if someone's going to reoffend, they do in the first three years. Right. And then it usually doesn't happen. So that's been moved down to five years. We're having some resistance from some of our Republican colleagues, uh, whether or not that uh, the commission had the, the statute authority to actually do that. But, you know, I'll, I'll continue to work on those issues. And, and, I, and I think that ultimately we need to really Think of the system that we have, which I believe looks for people to make mistakes and create a system that actually looks for people to have their successes okay. and to hold up those successes. I mean, when we talk about technical violations, I mean, that's absurd. Some of the things that people get, uh, you know, revoked for and, and get sent either sent to prison for the first time or sent back again. So. Um, you know, although I'm leaving the legislature, this work is really important and I'll continue to advocate. And, and you know, I, there's a small, small part of me that saw a lot of my white friends sort of wake up when they saw that horrific video of George Floyd being killed. I think it, I think it did that for a lot of people. And, and, and um, it kind of leads me to my next question, which is for Representative McClinton and, and um, A. Wellington. 
your work as a public defender and prosecutor, I know for both of you informs, uh, you know, kind of your reaction to the criminal justice system and the need for criminal justice reform. But, but can you recall the most dramatic of issues of disparity that you saw that led you to, to work so actively in this work that you do? And I'll ask you first, Representative McClinton. Absolutely. So for me, it was the day that I was a supervisor and a judge I was uh, very close with gave me a call and said, you need to get over here. I'm concerned about one of the clients your lawyers is handling. And I went over there and I found a young man who was 18 years old, who had three open drug cases. Two of them were felonies. One of them was a misdemeanor. And he was in court with his basketball coach from his HBCU. And the judge said, you know, I can't can't obviously make any determinations. All I can do is hear what's presented and make a ruling. But what I'm encouraging all of you to do is see whether or not you need to pursue options. And what she meant by that was, you know, drug treatment court or something that would not get him put out of the NCAA. And as a result, um, it took a lot of work. It took a lot of uh, finessing, uh, good relationships that I'm grateful to still have this day. Um, with working with the DA to create something new. Because of the posture of all his cases and the number of them, and as I'm retelling the story, it was actually four. You know, it wasn't really suitable for drug court. And because he was in school at, at HBCU out of Pennsylvania, he wasn't suitable as a candidate. So as I kept telling them, you know, anything that happens with any of these cases, which you roll the dice with that many, one of them is going to come back guilty. It's like his life and his future and his opportunities that he's had so far. And the craziest thing, Your Honor, is he got them one summer before going to school within like two or three weeks. Wow. Each one of these arrests were like stacked back to back to back. And I'm grateful to report that for a long time, you know, and a lot of finagling, we were able to create a new program just for him, just to try to get him on an, a supervised probation, probation that was without a verdict. So he did not have to ruin his record, get rid of his scholarship, his opportunity to have financial aid and to play in the NCAA. And he was able to stay at that school and finish the school and also be able to finish four years of unsupervised, or excuse me, of supervised probation without a verdict and not have to come back and get a conviction. So that was, to me, one of the dire situations where I saw there are many more like him who don't have a coach that comes with them or who's, who are in a totally different boat and set of circumstances. And a lawyer just sees as the young man shared from, you know, humanize my hoodie, a young black man with drugs. OK, well, these are the two options. People are not thinking creatively because they're not necessarily presented with compassionate circumstances to make them go the extra mile. So that's something that shows me as a policymaker now, it's on us to be able to create policy so that judges have options, district attorneys have options, and more importantly, that people are not punished from their worst couple of days or from some people who are in uniform and abusing their power, putting cases on people who are like him in the summer hanging around other folks. So, and so Al, tell me, I know, especially in terms of your system now that it's in place, you know, what has been the most dramatic impact that you've been able to have? Oh, it's tremendous. Uh, one case, uh, a young man received, uh, he was in law school, as a matter of fact, um, he received five years in prison for a DUI with a serious bodily injury. A passenger came off the back of his back of his bike after they left the bar. He received five years in prison. We find cases whereby uh, people received uh, for killing people, hitting them with a truck and running, you know, DUI manslaughter received probation and uh, community control. But the most egregious case that we were able to avoid, I guess, was a lady, uh, matter of fact, she's a white female, who was convicted of racketeering uh, last year, year before last, and she was facing minimum of four to a maximum of 35 years in prison. The state attorney was asking for 35 years in prison, but when the judge saw the uh, data that we sent in through ESAS, um, that judge had never given anybody over 12 years for that offense, and she had been on the bench for about 25, 30 years. So she wound up giving the lady uh, seven years in prison that saved the taxpayer $600,000 and saved her 28 years in prison. One other case we had a Af uh, uh, Hispanic male was charged with um, possession of a firearm by a convicted felon, which he armed himself to defend himself. He got the better of the person who was trying to kill him, killed that person, was charged with second degree murder, was found not guilty by a jury of his peers. Then they wanted to get a decade out of him for possession of a firearm that he only possessed because he was trying to defend himself. But once the prosecutor saw the data that we produced, they gave him the average, which was 18 months. So those are some of the extreme cases that we've seen. 
Okay, so th this question is for 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 Kenya and 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 Jason. Um, I I know there are policy implications and and public sentiment um, that can inhibit or kind of enhance your work when you're in the public forum like that. So how do you create change and how does your organization manage the demands of public sentiment and what people may be saying and what may people be, may be seeing? Um, and I'll, I'll go to you first, Kanye, Kanye, and then I'll, I'll come to you, Jason. Thank you so much, Judge. So oftentimes the public is with us. We know that according to an AP poll last summer, that a majority of Americans, a vast majority of Americans, 70% think that the criminal justice system needs a complete overhaul or it needs to be changed majorly. And I attribute that in large part to the fact is the video that we saw at the beginning of this program led on. Most of us know someone. We have a family member who's been incarcerated. That, that stat is actually one in two adults has a family member who's been incarcerated. So for millions of people in this country, the criminal legal system is very personal. And so when you also break down the, the stats according to demographics, you see that, yes, yeah, certainly Black people, other people of color think that the system needs to be overhauled more dramatically. But white people agree and share that sentiment as well. And we've also seen along party lines, yes, while Democrats may be the ones who more favorably um, lean towards reform, Republicans are there as well. And we have seen over the years at every level that there are red states, there are blue states, there are purple states that have been able to work collectively to move justice reform policies. Now, that being said, I saw one of the questions come up in the chat about New York and the efforts to roll back reform there in response to the increased crime, the harms to public safety narrative that is out there. And what I will say before handing this question over to Professor Soule is that in a lot of what he talked about is that there's, there's a lot of investment in keeping the status quo and that the system is, is designed to work as it is. So people get to a place of abolition because they know the system is doing exactly what it is designed to do. So why keep tinkering? Why keep trying to fix a system that when you eliminate one piece of it, it's just going to be replaced by another? So that's what is being seen in New York. You have a narrative. Again, when the narrative is put out there by law enforcement, it, it, it's, it has credibility, even if the data that is being used to push that narrative is not right. And so while we have generally people with us on our side, we do come up against a very loud and vocal minority really of system actors who want to remain employed, have a lot of profit to, to maintain with respect to the system that, that really is just has been a part of our, our society as long as we've known it, this, this law and order society. Thank you. So Jason. I mean, I, I often approach this work from a place of just having to survive the drug war because the game is being played in so many different ways where it's just like, I'm at a place where I'm like, I'm not that 19 year old kid that got caught with a gun. Right. I'm not that 21 year old that called, got, but it's still, it's still there if I apply for things. So it's like getting pardons and getting off probation early and housing rights and voting rights, all of those things are extremely important. And I support the people leading that work, but I want a bolder push against, like I met Angela Davis in 2004 and she rocked my, like <laughs> she rocked my world. Cause I'm like, I can be a professor. I can do this. Like I was asking some real questions cause I was an undergraduate student then. And I didn't know as a three time convicted felon what I really could do. Right. I didn't know what a criminal justice degree could do for me. Cause I'm like, man, y'all tell me I can't get nothing. You tell me I can only have these low wage jobs and you tell me this and I never understood it. So I always pushed in whatever job or in whatever capacity, but I realized that I wasn't really free. I was just visible. The shackles never came off of me. If the police still look at me as a quote unquote gang member, how am I supposed to like really like make it after this? So I realized, man, like 13th Amendment is real. So I'm keeping my attention on that. And if the 13th Amendment is saying slavery still exists, 
I'm trying to help free the slaves, the ones I know. Philip, how do you do that? I mean, how do you push back? How do you help just regular citizens? I mean, you 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 made it. <laughs> hey, like, hey, I got a lot of different strategies, but um, really just trying to be the best husband, father. I'll be an example, you know. I mean. You know, I wear my heart on my sleeves and I stand up for my values. Like Greg can tell you, I left my job in the mayor's office where I was making a hundred thousand. I could have just rolled that job out and just <laughs> like, like been like, hey man, I'm just going <laughs> to, I'm about my values. So I'm led by the ancestors. I'm not led by money. I'm not led by social media. I'm not led by other things people want me to be led by. I'm true to my family. I'm held accountable by a lot of amazing black women. And I just like really show up every day and do my work. I'm not concerned about the things, you know, that I can't really move. If I see a way to be a visionary or do some resistance work, I show up and I help lead. But, you know, for me, if I would have kept listening to what people told me I could be, I would never be nothing. I would be still living in the hood, still trying to, you know, pull myself up by the bootstraps, still trying not to sell drugs. No, I had to figure out on my own because they just wanted me to be another worker. And I'm like, no, man, that's not meant for me. I can't get with that role. And now I challenge the system because I know all them dirty cops. I know all of them people who was trying to, you know, act like they were standing up for the cause and they was really just standing up for themselves. So I just come with truth and integrity. And I feel like, you know, at the end of the day, whatever comes from that, I'm okay with. Thank you. So my, this ne next set of questions are for um, Lauren and, and, and Representative Dean. I mean, we've, we've talked about race and we've talked about race an awful lot in terms of its impact on the criminal justice system and what has happened in terms of, of, of the criminal justice system. Um, but we know that disparity can be felt differently um, depending upon your perspective in terms of who you are. Um, so, so my question it, it, to, to both of you is, is it's really kind of your comment on how that disparity or difference is felt. Um, first, as a member of the, the uh, of an indigenous community, and and how you see it played out, and and I think you've done it, done it some for us, Representative Dean. But then, you know, as a as a white male, seeing the the, for lack of a better word, the the privilege, even with a conviction. That, that you've been able to experience. Lauren. Thanks. Yeah, as I mentioned, there there's certainly a, a legal ramification because uh, Indians are, are also members of their tribe and because of their Indian status are subject to this different set of rules that apply to them, you know, dating back to the Indian Wars. Um, the ramifications are very real. Um, but I also think that the, it, it, I think for indigenous communities, it holds the key, but I think for lots of communities, it holds the key because it's also the route to salvation. Um, we've talked a lot about how, you know, there's certainly a lot of bad actors in the criminal justice system, but the failures of the justice system are not because of just the bad actors. It's set up to fail. And, and so we have to completely rewire the criminal justice system. What's a successful model? Well, we sort of talk, talked about it, one that is actually accountable to the community. And so turning back to the community, what, what does a, a meaningful, responsive criminal justice system that actually serves the community? Because the community is not being served when we just incarcerate everyone for the rest of their lives. Um, that that so for for Indians, you know, relying on our sovereignty and our ability to self determine. I saw, you know, one of the questions is like, you know, imagine all of the billions, trillions of dollars we would save if we weren't busy incarcerating people. What would we do with that money? I don't know. I mean, there's so many possibilities, and really, the answer is going to be different depending on the community. And so, so my response is like, the community should be really decide deciding that, you know, for some, I think it's going to be those talking circles that are really focused on substance abuse and reform. For some, it's going to be preventative, uh, you know, Head Start education. It's all going to be different. It's all going to be wonderful. But uh, th this whole centralized paternalistic processing of, of individuals as if they are isolated actors that don't have context and communities that's not working. Um, 
But to go back to your question of like, does race only matter? For Indians, no. Our, our dual citizenship is everything. Our ability to, to go back to our communities and to vote in our communities and have political participation there is everything. And it really stems back to the United States being accountable to tribes as sovereign partners. And Representative Ding. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the issue of privilege is something that, you know, unfortunately, far too many white people aren't even aware of the privilege. And part of that is they're busy living their lives every day the way they lived it yesterday and the way they're likely to live it tomorrow. Uh, for those folks that live in what I would say are more homogenous communities, they, they, don't, they don't have a sense or an understanding of, of, of the, the plight and the obstacles that are put in ways uh, of, of many people in, in you know, impoverished and community colors. And, and, and so they're, they're totally unaware. And, and that's why when I mentioned, what, you know, the, the actual seeing the video of the murder of George Floyd really began them to, they had to think differently. They had to recalculate because, you know, many of them were like, well, you know, I mean, well, Black people shouldn't be doing stuff against the law. Well, you know, I mean, it's like, really, uh, how, how can you even think about going there? Uh, but, I, but I think that awareness is going to be difficult. Uh, and the reason that I, I think it's going to be really difficult is, is uh, you know, uh, Professor Powell talks about, you know, the issue of power. And oftentimes, whiteness and power go hand in hand. So when you come to grips with whiteness and that relationship of power, the way you hang on to both of those is one, to try to stay in power and two, try to act like you're better people. I mean, you know, I mean, I hate to use this analogy because it's not always a great analogy, but Adolf Hitler talked about a superior race of people. I think there are still a lot of white people in the United States that would never associate themselves with that type of thinking, but there is sort of that type of thinking in their heads that we're superior, we're better, you know, we, we, we have the ability to do well. And, you know, I, I, I hearken back to a video I saw um, several months ago where a coach or someone had all the students line up online and said, we're gonna have a race today. And then he said, okay, if, if, if you grew up in a, you know, family that. of two parents takes, yeah. you know, steps forward. And he did all this. And, and, and it really put in sort of the physical form. I'm an architect right. by training. So the physical form is important. And people began to understand, yeah, our system is really effed up. You know, I understand why Jason's like, we need to blow all this <laughs> up completely. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, believe me, I, I, I'm, I'm not a fan of policing as we have it today. I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm all for changing our incarceration system in this country because it doesn't work. It costs, and, and I, t I tell people, it costs you money. This isn't exactly. one, it's not right. making you safer. It's actually costing you money, right. which ultimately is hurting you more and more and more. So, so I, you know, I, I think there's a lot of space right now to begin to move to people. And I think we need to have these conversations. Uh, and I think it needs to be, you know, a multi-voiced conversation. Uh, you know, one thing I learned a long, long time ago in architecture, I, I was on the national board of the AIA, American Institute of Architects. And, and I was astonished when, you know, women would get up and talk about how the, the profession doesn't give them opportunities and how people of color would get up and talk about how they don't have opportunities. And when myself and a couple of other uh, members on the board, directors, actually who are aware, would get up and say the same things, it was perceived differently. You know, which is, one, it's, it, it's absurd yeah. that, that, that we're, we're at, still at that place. But two, it tells you that sometimes a messenger is important. And sometimes it's important that that message is being spoken, like I said early on, by those people directly impacted. Absolutely. Well, I want to give our audience a chance. I mean, they, they've been great and, 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 and listened so much. Um, and I, uh, Kelly, I know you've been looking at the 
the chat feed and I've not been able to really keep an eye on it um, to to get those questions or see some questions. I'm not sure if there are any questions out there. I'm looking, I see Jonathan out there from the Florida um, Justice Center. Uh, so I know they're, 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 you know, and they do great things in terms of being, what did, what did you, what you all say, the first um, legal, criminal legal services, um, free legal services for criminal defendants that's, that's been offered in terms of, um, of Florida and, and being approved by the Florida Bar. But what are some of the questions we have out there, Kelly? Okay, I'll start at the beginning. Uh, and I think that some of the panelists have seen these questions and maybe starting to answer them. And some have come to me privately. Um, uh, Ms. Bennett, I believe that you answered the question regarding some, uh, New York has reported some issues with the recent cash bail being stopped. I think you, your answer was uh, status quo. Unless you want to elaborate on that, I'll jump to the next question. Well, well let me ask you this, Kenya, though, because you've not talked about it, but I thought you all actually do bail, um, pay the bail, not only in New York, or but outside of the state as well, right? Or how, how, how does that work? Yes, so we are in more than 20 cities throughout the country. We're actually not in New York. Um, after bail reform took effect, um, there was, there was, we were put out of business, which again is the goal of the bail project. And so we are in, like I said, more than 20 cities throughout the country. And the, the question that's being raised with respect to New York, again, yes, there's, there are going to be interests, of course, that want to maintain the status quo. And whether it's New York or Illinois, or there are going to be uh, law enforcement, other system actors who do not want to see the system upended. And so we have our work cut, up, cut out for us uh, in every jurisdiction in which we're operating and those in which we're not. Thank you. Kelly, what else did we have out there? Okay, um, there is a question. Um, Mr. Barlow typed it in here, but if he could verbally uh, briefly explain a little bit more about his sentencing software. How does it work? Who has access to it? Okay, yeah. Um, it, it is web-based software that we only allow attorneys uh, to use it. Uh, it has access to 2.2 million sentencing records from October 1st, 1998, right now through June 30th of 2019, soon to be June 30th of 2020. We get our records from the uh, clerk's office of each respective clerk's clerk in Florida with 67 clerk's offices and 20 um, circuits. And so uh, judges can use it, attorneys can use it, prosecutors can use it, and we sell subscriptions. We have, uh, of the 20 public defender offices, we have four of them as our clients right now. And we also have private attorneys in most of the uh, 20 judicial circuits. But we also do what's called a custom search for lawyers who don't have a, a, a huge caseload. So they can pay for an individual search and we will um, send them the data uh, electronically, and uh, that's basically how it works. Technologiesforjustice.com, technologiesforjustice.com. If you go there, we have a demo on that website to show you actually how it works. And what we do is we take criminal history data, upload it in the system, and then we, we have a proprietary uh, web-based system that'll send that data where we want it to go. So you can compare apples and apples and oranges and oranges. And so it helps judges to make an educated decision because what happens a lot of times is a judge might, let's say, sentence somebody to probation, you know, last year. Well, a similar, similarly situated person, a prosecutor is trying to give that person two years in prison. Well, that judge won't remember that other case, but this system can come up and show that judge immediately. Look, you're about to be disparate in your sentencing on this particular person in relation to everybody else or whatever. So that's how it basically works. Okay. Excellent. Uh, due to COVID, has any, have any of our panelists seen or advocated reform on either a national or local level that addresses the inability of the accused to meet financial obligations because of job loss or have you seen reform movement to release or divert in custody detention due to, uh, I'm sorry, more coming in, uh, because the court is backing up due to COVID. I can try to rephrase that because I just read that, but I think the question. 
I think I think the question is, have you have any of the panelists done anything in response to maybe the, the backlog, the court back, backlog for their clients? As, and I think our practicing COVID. attorneys and I, I was trying to look at, I mean, it looks like we may have to look to our, our chair of our section uh, because that- I, I can tackle that. Okay, good. Oh, that's true. You're practicing right now too, yes. It, it, well, you know, you talked about, Judge, you talked about, you know, laws, policies, practices, and procedures. One of the things that we're offering right now is it's an offer that I just made last week, a pro bono basis. Uh, everybody's caseloads are backed up right now. So we're offering, um, and I made it to our circuit right now, the fourth circuit, that if, if the judges want to work with us and the prosecutors, we can work with the prosecutors, the judges, and the public defenders, run data for them for free, and help them resolve some of these cases because a lot of them can be resolved in plea bargaining. 98% of all cases are settled in plea bargaining. So what we could do is run that data for them free of charge and let them see what the average sentences should be for each person. Let them make uniform offers to everybody and that can help, you know, bleed out the system. So we've made that offer to our uh, prosecutor and the judges here. And if they reject it, I'm going to go to the next circuit. So, that's so the question is, so I, so I guess is you're seeing the bike backlog then. I mean, that's the question. Are we seeing the COVID oh, yeah. backlog? Because I certainly oh. had a concern yes. about people who want face-to-face -face contact. And, 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 you know, forcing a person to have a trial by Zoom. I mean, I, I would imagine defense attorneys like some I know who shall remain nameless, uh, you know, they're, they're never going to be attracted to having a, a, a trial by Zoom. We are absolutely, we are absolutely opposed. <laughs> we are absolutely opposed to having trials by Zoom. Yeah, I guess that one. <laughs> and so, in the state of Florida, there is a huge backlog in criminal cases. I'm here in Broward. Um, we only have status conferences or any, nothing that requires an evidentiary value here in criminal cases. So, in family court or civil court, other areas of the court, you can address it and have Zoom trials or Zoom hearing. But if, in criminal court, all we can do via Zoom is um, we can see our clients virtually, and we can also um, take depositions if we're so inclined. But those of us, those attorneys, defense attorneys like myself, we like to be up close and personal. We're asking those difficult questions. So our clients, quite frankly, are lingering as um, the question was posed in there. But in some jurisdictions more than other, the courts have been taking that in consideration. Here in Broward, the chief judge is sensitive about um, limiting and quite frankly, reducing the, um, the population, jail population, because it's hard for them to try to maintain um, COVID safe environment with so many inmates. In um, many counties, Miami-Dade and other counties, they're actually allowing attorneys to file motions to have their clients put to be released from from incarceration, even if they, you know, if they have a low bail that they couldn't pay, like is this bail really necessary? So starting to have this conversation that we're talking about here about is this bail necessary? So COVID has, in my, I mean, there's a lot of bad things with COVID, but in my opinion, COVID has forced some serious conversations in the criminal justice system that we were not having before, because now they're asking the question, is this necessary? Quite frankly, they're doing it for I me, mean, maybe for their own convenience to make sure the population doesn't infect so many people. But it does benefit the, the inmates so that there are many more inmates that are able to get out because they want to reduce that population. She asked a question about what about the inmates who have financial obligations and not have not been able to cure them. And I can only speak for myself. I haven't had one single client of my any of my criminal clients to be sanctioned for not be meeting a criminal financial obligation so far during COVID. Now, wait when those courthouses open back up. That might be a different story. But in the meantime, um, they haven't, the judges have not been in, uh, imposing such significant things as it relates to, um, you know, paying, a, paying restitution, for instance. Great, thank There's you. One more thing. Uh, there, are judges, there are judges that are allowing open pleas and, uh, and contested sentencing hearings by Zoom. I witnessed one in Miami that, you know, that helped the lawyer on uh, last month and it went very well. So though they are taking pleas by Zoom. And and I'm assuming at that point that, you know, the person's getting out. So that that's the advantage you're seeing with the individual, uh, you know, hopefully in terms of looking at it like that. Because, you know, I worry about the privacy issues in terms of a Zoom link and, you know, forcing an attorney to have that kind of contact and what that means. Um, any other questions, Kelly? We have several. So. Okay, let me let you go. <laughs> So to Mr. Barlow and Lauren or, or, or other panelists, what do you think is a key reason that prosecutors and judges tend to disregard the data that you may implore them to consider at sentencing? I, I think that, um, no, I, I know, uh, first of all, is fear. Um, and what we're doing is so radical, it's so different. Uh, judges are afraid of it. 
I mean, I, lawyers were calling me up saying, Barlow, you know, they're terrified of what you're doing. I'm like, wait a minute. All I'm doing is showing you what you're about to do before you do it. That's all I'm doing. And so if you're, and I've heard judges say this, I don't care what any other judge has sentenced anybody to. And I challenge them on the spot right there. Cause I say, look, you don't, you don't say that when we, when we're dealing with a motion hearing and we're looking at case law precedent, you don't say you don't, you don't care what other judges decided on this legal issue. So the sentencing is just as important. So a lot of it is fear of the unknown. They don't know what they're looking at. A lot of them are, you know, older judges too. They're not technically uh, inclined, but I can tell you this, if, most of them who will sit down and watch me do a demo, they love it because they understand that this is not the boogeyman. This can help you from being embarrassed. It can also help you from getting probably voted out of office if you pay attention to these sentences that have been handed down by yourself and your colleagues before you is issue a sentence in a pending case. So it, it, the knife cuts both ways, but I think a lot of it is ignorance or lack of knowledge and fear of the unknown. If I, sorry, if I may, this is not necessarily my area of expertise and I have not seen your demo yet, but I speculate that it's also challenging what is otherwise the sort of fallacy that each case is its own isolated individual that, you know, is operating in this like completely decontextualized sphere and that like, oh, I'm just looking at this person and just these facts and it has no bearing on this entire realm of racially biased sentencing. And when I'm confronted with the facts, it's jarring because it, you know, implicates me as an actor in this whole thing, but it also challenges my approach, which is supposed to be individualized, that these are all isolated things that aren't in fact in this whole racial society. And so it's, you know, I think it's challenging on a, on a number of different levels that can be jarring. It's, it's bigger. I mean, you, you did a great job of explaining, explaining it on one level, but it's a greater level. Let me tell you. Every, you know, every state is different. Florida has what's called a criminal punishment code. It went from a guideline system. Now the criminal punishment code and the guideline system, what they do is they objectify injuries. Like for instance, a sexual penetration is 80 points. If you, if you go in one orifice, it's 80 points. If you go in another one, it's 80 points. If you slap somebody, it's 40 points. If you shoot somebody, you know, it's codified. And so what we do is we show apple and apple and orange to orange comparisons. This person received 80 points, yet they got 12 years in prison. Here's another person who received 80 points for the same type of injury, yet they got probation. And so you, 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 hit, it, you hit the nail on the head, but it's even worse than you just articulated. So they are yeah. terrified of it. And there's another system um, in New, in Washington State. Their their prosecutors actually is working with a private individual, a, a returning citizen, who is trying who has developed a a, um, a a computer program in that state to look at at sentencing and encourage judges and prosecutors. This actually allows the, the prosecutor on their own to, to revisit sentences that they find inequities with. And, and we're looking at similar, a similar um, law that's being recommended here in the state of Florida, because that's always the issue. You know, well, I can't legally consider there's this no legal issue. You know, so, so it, it's opening up that whole can um, to a great, dis to the advantage, I think, of individuals for judges to be able to look at those sentences or prosecutors to be able to look at those sentences and do something about it and to have a um, analytical system that does that and to know that that's being replicated now in other places um, that people see the advantage of it. Do you have another question, Kelly? I have like five more questions. Okay. <laughs> They're coming in. Well, good. Um, We're going to get to them. Yes, I think we can get to them. According to the Bureau of Justice Statistics, roughly $81 billion is the annual cost of mass incarceration in the United States. This is obviously a high number. So where do you think these billions of dollars should be invested in? In low-income communities, educational institutions to teach students of the court system and the impact it can have on their lives? rehabilitation facilities what and i she wrote her name here it's one of my students so i just i thought it was I, one of mine I, I was saying that had to be one of my students no it's one of mine <laughs> who do you want to tackle that question uh, miss uh 
Representative Dean, do you want to? Yeah, I'm happy there? happy to jump in. I, you know, when we look at what are the things that ultimately happens to people, so that they end up in incarcerated, uh, which is really what we're talking about. I, I think it's really important to look at how we can reinvest that money. For instance, uh, I had a neighbor who was being evicted out of her house. She had three kids. She didn't know where she was going. She was going to go live with family. And, and we all know what that scenario ends up. Well, chances are one of those kids may end up in the criminal justice system and may end up costing us you know, $300,000 over a 10 year period. Well, couldn't we find like $300 a month to keep her in her house and have her kids have stable uh, housing, which means they'd have stable education. We should be able to redirect money to have a situation where people can lead their best lives. And I think that happens at the community level. And I think it includes healthcare, it includes, um, you know, definitely housing. It includes, you know, making their community a, what I would say is a joyous place to live. Uh, I had a Bush fellowship a few years ago and, and I looked at the impact of the built physical environment on the way people inhabit the world. Well, people that wake up in great neighborhoods walk out their door every morning thinking, you know, I can do whatever I want in the world. Whereas people that walk, wake up and walk out in impoverished communities feel like the world really doesn't care about them. So, so how do we create a world in which people walk out their door everywhere and feels they can make a difference in the world? And I think that that's how we should begin to invest that money. Great point. Any other panelists <laughs> wanted to comment on that question? All right, we'll go to our next question. Okay, in Florida, and this is uh, in Florida, we face many barriers to bail reform. One barrier is the lack of empathy for those who have been arrested. Another is the strength of bail bonds lobby, which has led to the passage of statutes that mandatorily deduct fines, fees, and court costs prior to bail. Wait, um, bail is returned unless posted by a bail bonds agency. This is causing substantial harm to low income households and making bail funds cease operations. How can we build momentum for change? That might be one of your students. And, and, and that's really a great point. I mean, we see it all the time. We take the fees out, out the sentencing, you know, and all that the bond would be returned except for the fees and costs that have been assessed by this court, you know, and, 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 and um, Jason, Professor, I think, you know, it sounds like a racket. It's slavery. <laughs> like, I got to go back to that, man. All of this stuff is slavery, man. It all feeds the machine. Like, real talk, like, I had to really, like, study and be all in them books to really crack the code. But come on, man. Like, people always say, like, man, you know, what? where would we reinvest the money? I tell white folks all the time, give them what you had growing up. That's all you got to do. You don't got to worry about nothing else. I just, I'm talking basic needs. We drive past people all the time who you can clearly see need resources. We do this all the time and say, where, man, where are we going to put the money if we take it from the car? Where? That's like, man, just look around. Like, like Ray said, stepping out into a nice area and all of that. It's like, come on, man. Like, we need financial literacy. We need a real education, a true understanding of history. Like, we, we, we being bamboozled in so many different ways. It's like, man, we got to tear down capitalism. We got to tear down patriarchy. It's like, we need bold, courageous, you know, steps being made. And I think too many people want to play it safe. It's like, my ancestors died so I could have a voice. So I ain't wasting my time with, you know, like, I'm, I, I just, it's like, I know a lot of people want to do really well and do good, but it's like, slavery still exists and it's right in our face. And we, we, just walk past it. It's like, there's no way a police department needs an exorbitant amount of millions when you see people starving. And you always say, man, you know, why do we have these gangs? Or why do we, it's like basic needs are not being met. Like, I didn't but how do we push to, to have that, that recognized? Because I, I agree with you and you make a great point, but, but, but what are we gonna say and do to people to make them be willing to give up theirs? You know, what do we say to the police to say, your job would be so much easier if we fed people and people have what they needed so they would need to steal? Man, it's just political will. It's like people, you know, run campaigns on saying they're going to do this and do that. But when it comes down to it, 
it just never happens. You just you just keep on saying you're gonna do something. So for me, hold people accountable. It's like I see people all the time taking pictures with poverty pimps or people who are bad to the community or people who are not standing on the right side of history. And we act like they good people, man. It's like cut that out. You you fooling a lot of kids if you stand next to this person and be like, this person is super amazing and they's about to do all of this. And then when they don't do it, you done broke this kid heart. I grew up in Chicago. We had Mayor Harold Washington, first black mayor in Chicago. He had he gave us all the hope in the world, and he died suspiciously. Just come. So it's like, give me a true sense of what I'm up against. Don't lie to me, man. When I was a kid, people lied. People told me Christopher Columbus discovered all of this. I was in my like, I was really, I was in my 20s when I found out that. So it's like. Let's give the real information to the young people and allow them to chart their own course. As adults, we need to say, hey, you need to know the Fourth Amendment. You should know about voting rights. Look at that 14th Amendment and see how that works. Your First Amendment rights, you can say this. You got to think. What, what Ray Dean like, got in trouble for was way worse than anything I had. Like, I mean, like, I'm just saying, if we look at that, what, what was that? Like, I got caught with a firearm as a kid, and I got caught with drugs. No violence against a person. How did I get entangled in that system so deeply? So, you know, it's like, let's challenge that in a real way. Absolutely. Let's see, yes. more can questions? I, can I address that? Mm -hmm. can, I, can I address well, that? Well, yes, okay, who's that? The question, who's that? The question yeah. is, and we have some more questions. Build, mm -hmm. How can we build momentum? Go on, go on. I just kind of want to zero in, because I think this is a critical question. Absolutely. Um, how can we build momentum for change? Let me just be practical here. Um, one of the ways, one of the things I used to do is ask for cash bonds and in you know a cash bond for a lower amount let the person post the cash with the jail they'll release them and if the charges are dropped they get all the money back if the charges are not dropped if they enter a plea or whatever then they'll deduct the court costs from that give them the difference now if there was a policy put in place at the courthouses for that to happen it would substantially address this issue because that 10 percent that they're giving to a bondsman is gone period point but you know right. that bondsman lobby is huge in florida i know it i know it i know it and they pay to they give not pay but they give donations <laughs> to the judges on the campaigns but i'm just saying <laughs> this is a hard thing to do but that's where it can help if judges start even if one percent of the judges give a cash bond, it can make a huge difference in a person's life. They can use some of that money for attorneys, some of that money for court costs. And uh, if the charges are dropped, which a lot of times they are, they'll get all of it back. That would okay. help. It's all right. Challenging. All right. We're, we're hitting up against the time. I, I, I don't want to stop this conversation. Um, we have some conversations, uh, some questions still in the chat. I'm yeah. going to ask our speakers to, to look at them later before, you know, before we end totally. And if we can address those, we certainly will. Um, can we ask one more, fellas? Do you mind? I think it's a really yeah. good question. Okay. No, let's um, go ahead. We'll, we'll, okay, we'll, we'll push you. it. Yes. And it's for Raymond Dean. If the messenger is as important as the message, to whom should the message be addressed in light of political and public opposition to broaden the scale of criminal justice reform? Who should that message be directed to or from? Yes. Well, to, to whom should it, the message be addressed to? Yes. You know, I, I, I think that, you know, Jason talked a, a, a bit about this and, and, and people that have political courage. And what I mean by that is those individuals that have been elected to office who have the opportunity for their voices to be loud and for their ability to try to change what the discussion and conversations are. Uh, and those individuals that are willing to risk their political future to do what's right. <laughs> no, I mean, that, that's, a, that's a serious, important thing. It and is. And, and far too often, once you get in office, you start thinking about, well, okay, what does this mean for my next election? election How can exactly. I sort of sugarcoat this? Exactly. You know, um, and, and, and I think there are some people that, that just need some encouragement to know that they'll sleep better at night if they're talking about criminal justice issues in the way that they know is right versus in the way that they think is politically expedient. I couldn't have said it better. That that ends us on a great note. So I wanted to end with a chance for each of the speakers um, 
to, to, to make a comment. Um, so we know the title of this panel has been Activate Diversity, Pathways to Equal Justice. So what I want to ask each of you is in one minute or less, can you identify a critical pathway or action that you would recommend as a pathway to justice? And I'll start with um, Representative McClinton. She just text she had she had to leave. Oh, we lost her. No, we I mean, lost. and she told us in terms of looking at at um, reform uh, about sentencing and 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 probation. Um, so that gives each of you all an extra one minute, ten seconds, twenty seconds. Uh, Kanye, you're the next up. Then I'll just take you in the order we started. Sure. Thank you, Judge. So this has been discussed a bit throughout the conversation, but really centering the voices of community and centering the voices of those who are impacted by the system, in this instance, the criminal legal system, in the work that you do. I think that that's critical to figuring out solutions, and it's our responsibility to make sure that we are representative of the people who are harmed by the policies that we are looking to change. Thank you. A. Wellington. You're on mute. Yeah, trying to get unmuted. Mm -hmm. uh, I, you know, my answer might be a little different. I'll, I'll say it like this right here. Um, I run into all kinds of people in this legal profession. Some of them are gifted to do what they do, and some of them shouldn't even be in it at all on any level. I mean, prosecutors shouldn't be prosecuting, defense attorneys shouldn't be defending, judges shouldn't be on the bench. So I'll just say this right here. You need to pray and ask God what, where you fit in in society, what your gifts and callings are. And if, and if criminal justice or equity and sentencing or whatever is that, then God will lead you there. But seriously, there are a lot of people who are doing things just to get a check and they're just causing problems. And so I just ask, I would say pray and ask what your calling is, find out what it is and fit in there and do the best that you can with God's help. All right, Jason, Professor. Um, I think, you know, like I said before, well, let's be honest. Let's tell the truth about what's happening out here. They're snatching black bodies. They're snatching indigenous women. Let's be real about, you know, what we're up against. But hold police accountable in solitary confinement. You got to disrupt and dismantle the school to prison pipeline. Let's stop calling it a criminal justice system because there's no justice in it. So. Let's call it a criminal system or something along those lines. And let's like really look at ending probation early. Um, and from top to bottom, let's just look at cops, courts and corrections. And at the end of the day, we can answer some of our own phone calls. It doesn't have to go to 911. We got safe people in the community. Think about who you need to call when you're in an unsafe situation. Let's start there. Let's reduce them calls to police so they don't say, Hey, it's call driven. They they are calling us. No, let's reduce those calls so we can love and protect ourselves. Thank you. Judge, I, I, I'm sorry. Uh, I, with all due respect, uh, it is a justice system. You have to fight for it. I mean, I'm in it. I'm in the belly of the beast. It's about money. And, and I know that there are many circumstances and situations. Where, you know, even the case I mentioned when I first started talking, ultimately, you know, we were able to get him out um, and he suffered a long time. But Justice is available. And that's why I say, you know, some people are in it just for a check, but the ones who are in it to win it and we're gifted to do it, uh, justice can be done. And I see it all the time. It's hard, you know, but it's worth the fight. But it does, it, it, it turns slow, but we do have a justice system. Now, is there equi inequitable treatment in it? Absolutely. And that's what I fight every day, but it is a justice system. Okay. Um, Lauren. Our other professor. Um, well, I guess, uh, yes, I think we the system needs uh, a complete rework, probably would be more efficient to abolish and start over. Um, but I challenge instead that for so many um, people of color, especially indigenous, but not exclusively indigenous, it's about visibility. Mm -hmm. um, and so, uh, you know, before you do anything or advocate for anything, you know, am I being inclusive? Did I remember to think of tribes? And, and I challenge everyone here, you are currently sitting on indigenous land. You are presently a guest on indigenous land. Do you know 
whose land you're on? Do you know who your, who your sovereign neighbors are? If not, I encourage you to find out who the original inhabitants of your land are, who are the stewards, and how are you helping to make yourself indigenous to your space? Because I think, you know, respect for where you're at, for who your neighbors are, is incumbent upon being a community member and, and really being part of the process of developing a, a criminal justice system that is truly responsive to your community. Um, it sounds hokey, but, you know, the land is as much a part of our system as the processes and technology with it. Absolutely. And last, last word goes to you, Ring. Well, uh, speaking from stolen Dakota land, uh, it's, um, this is a really, really seemingly simple question, but I, I, I think it's really, really hard. I, I, I think folks need to look inside themselves and see what they're willing to give up and what they're willing to do uh, and sacrifice to create change. I'd say look around you, see organizations or other individuals that are doing the type of work that you would be interested in doing and engage them. And also work with state legislators. I mean, most state legislators, if you contact their office, they'd be willing to, you know, before COVID sit down and have a cup of coffee, now have a Zoom call, get to know them and get to know what's important to them. And that gives you then the opportunity to push them. You know, I, I love the term, hold them accountable, but holding someone accountable is actually a two-way street. It's not just me, you need to do what you need to do because I have a responsibility in that equation as well. So, so that's what I would put out there. And uh, this has truly been a, a, a pleasure to be with all of you today and, and to speak on this critical issue. I really want to thank all of our panelists. This has been a wonderful opportunity, and I really thank you for, for participating. We failed to mention earlier our uh, diversity director who's on the line with us asking the questions. So all of this Activate Diversity series is coming under the direction of Kelly Adams, so we can also congratulate her for all of her Absolutely. efforts. Absolutely. It's yes, yes. The person asking the question it was great. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you, everyone. This is